Start with the joke. That's me on the left. That's Kathy Reek on the right. We're trying to get away with stuff. <clears throat> but seriously, this never works. They're not going to forget that they requested something. Uh, on the other hand, smiling helps because just having a good rapport with auditors goes a long way towards, say, you need an extension on a request. They will be, you know, if you have a good uh, relationship with them, they will be much more inclined to work with you on those kinds of issues. <clears throat> So a little quiz, how often are we audited? And this is SRS I was thinking about when I wrote that question. A, less than five times a year. B, five to 10 times a year. C, we are always being audited. And keep in mind, at any given time, SRS is managing about 5,000 active awards. So if you guessed, C, you are correct. So I always have, you know, six, 10, sometimes 12 audits going at the same time. So the volume is quite high. Um, this is about uh, going on eight years worth of data. You can see the grand total on the lower right. 263 audit projects completed during that period. And these are just the ones that I recorded. There might be others that I'm aware, not aware of, but it works out to be about three per month. And this is a, a pivot table on by sponsor, who's performing the audit or who provided the funding is a better way to say it. So the number one by far, is the Cancer Prevention and Research Institute of Texas. Many of you are familiar with that sponsor. Um, it was, it's a fairly new state agency. It was created 12, 14 years ago, something like that. And as the name implies, they start um, doling out awards related to researching cures for cancer and uh, preventative measures like colonoscopies, et cetera. They'll help pay for that stuff. <clears throat> anyway. They wrote some very onerous requirements into the Texas Administrative Code when they created that state agency. And we deal with those now um, every day. So they have a very active compliance department themselves. So they always have several audits ongoing, um, as well as in their awards, they have a requirement that we have to go hire a CPA firm every year and to perform audits of the awards to TAMU, HSC, TEAS, and Ag Research are the members right now. So that's four audits. Ag Extension used to have some, but currently they don't have any active awards. So it's just the volume is crazy with CPRIT. Uh, we, get, we do get findings because I said the, the requirements are very onerous. And then the second one in line there is the federal single audit that's performed by the State Auditor's Office of Texas. It's a statewide audit. We seem to be on a three-year cycle for the detailed review. So 2015, very detailed uh, review. 2018 again, and then 2021 is a very detailed review. And they choose different system members uh, it used to be that HSC and TAMU were separate entities in their eyes. Now they're one entity in their eyes, which has helped some because then you only have one population, one sample selection for those two members together. But they've audited in the past ag research and TEAS because those are our other high volume um, for federal awards within the AM system. Uh, when they when it's an off year, when it's not 2015, 2018, 2021, when it's the detailed transaction testing, they do follow up on any findings that they had in the in the report prior year. So it's rare that we don't have anything to do related to the single audit in, in one year. And then TCEQ, Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, they're fairly active in their audit department. 
Sandy is very active. Access to Justice Foundation, that's a private entity that awards to the Tamu Law School. And they written into all of their awards is a requirement again that we go out and hire a CPA firm and perform an audit and then provide the audit results to the sponsor. Office of the Governor, fairly active, but extremely detailed in their reviews. So I know some of you again have worked with the Office of the Governor and know that um, they can be difficult. And in my experience, they are difficult. <clears throat> NSF, of course, we have huge number of awards with NSF. So it's no surprise that they would want to know how we're um, managing the awards. Um, some of those reviews are very detailed as well. There was one that ended December 2020 that took 18 months and covered TAMU HSC Galveston awards. Um, Gomery, that that that's the Gulf of Mexico Research Institute. It was formed after the Deep Horizon uh, oil spill, and that's a private entity. They had a lot of awards to Galveston. TAMU, other bunch of sub awards related to those projects as well. So they were fairly active. I'm not sure if that institute's still active, but um, anyway. Department of Justice, NIH, Methodist Healthcare Ministries, I think they support the Colonius program at TAMU, um, Texas Workforce Commission. Um, and then you'll see a lot of other on the right side, state and federal agencies. Just to comment, I guess, um, Homeland Security is auditing us right now. It's a huge project, just like 40 to $50 million project. Texas HHSC, Health and Human Services Commission. <clears throat> Those audits are fairly in-depth, um, as well as the coordinating board audits. Those are pretty in-depth and uh, take a long time. USAID audited a huge project, um, Ag Research, recently. And then on down the list. Anyway, point being, there are a lot of audits and um, we're dealing with it every day. This is the same data, just sliced differently by member. <clears throat> TAMU and HSC have the most, HSC is primarily up there because of, they have the most secret awards. There's probably 25 of them or so. so uh, you know, their compliance department at Seaford is constantly reviewing those awards. Some of the reasons we might have an audit <clears throat> is that the auditors are trying to provide either at the federal level, maybe Congress, their administrators at the top of their uh, federal agencies. Um, the boards of various state agencies, et cetera. They wanna provide some assurance that we are good custodians of the funds and we comply with the laws, rules, and regulations, terms of the agreement, um, that we spend the money appropriately. In some cases, if there's a programmatic aspect to the audit, in other words, the technical side of it, they might review the technical reports and milestones related to the science. And then they will look at our internal control structure and make some comments about, you know, whether they think the controls are effective. Um, having come from the audit world, this I put this little to, uh, graphic together because I just, point of it is like audit, they're not just making stuff up. It's a very structured process and it has various phases. And I want to just reiterate these to you a little bit so you get a better idea of maybe where the auditors are coming from. So on the, on the left here in the planning phase, the auditor is going to say, oh, we have this set of awards that we made in 2021. Which ones do we think are most risky? Which ones should we spend our time looking at? So sometimes they might not look at your award and sometimes they will. It just depends on their risk factors and some of the so judgment is a big part of it too. But 
prior audit results could could come into play there. And then once they choose uh, the um, TAMU audit they're going to look at, they'll decide when they're going to perform the work, what the scope should be, should they just look at financial aspects or should they include programmatic aspects and so forth. <clears throat> and then they'll set up a time where they can talk with us, announce the audit and just lay out the scope for us, which is really helpful. And then they move on to the, what we would call the preliminary survey. So this is where they might send you questionnaires, so forth. And th what they really want to do is gain an understanding of the accounting or reporting activities and the control environment. So they sometimes do that through interviews. They used to do more interviews before COVID when they were on site. Now it's mostly emails and Zoom calls and um, like questionnaires and surveys instead of interviews. Um, so responding to the auditor's request, I just wrote TAMUS, but that could be SRS or a system member or whoever. Uh, we have to provide the copies of the policies and procedures that they requested and complete the questionnaires to the best of our ability. And then after they have some idea of the transaction period that they wanna look at, they'll request transaction data files. So we usually use business objects to run those and we'll provide those to the auditors. Auditors usually step back at that point and they perform you know, their own evaluation of internal controls and that refines their testing, what they wanna test in field work. So moving to field work, they would have already gone through our data files, maybe performed some analytics, decided they wanna focus on travel or personnel or contracted services, whatever they're interested in. They'll select a sample and they'll provide us the voucher numbers and, and all that information. So we can go pull that, that documentation for them. So we'll provide the documentation, the auditor, auditor goes through it all, they decide whether it's the documentation is sufficient and they look for compliance like proper approvals, um, whether procurement was correct given the dollar amount and so forth. And then inevitably they'll have a bunch of questions for us. And then they'll come to some conclusions about the effectiveness of the internal controls based on what they find during that transaction testing. So then we'll move into the reporting phase and they'll have some preliminary findings typically, and we'll discuss those with them. And then that gives us an opportunity then to say, hey, you're not entirely correct on this. You know, maybe you misunderstood or we didn't provide you some piece of documentation that you need. So that gives us an opportunity usually to correct any misunderstandings. And once, once the findings are pretty solid, uh, they'll hold an exit meeting and participation in that can vary across, you know, it could be SRS, PI could be involved, business coordinator, et cetera. Um, then the auditors will issue a draft report and ask us to prepare responses, which I write a lot of responses for the organization. So I'm typically involved in that. Um, and then they'll incorporate our responses publish a final report. Sometimes it's public information, sometimes it's not. And then of course, part of their directive as auditors is not, that's not the end of it, right? They wanna know that some action is, has been taken. So they might wait six months, eight months, a year, and they'll come back and say, well, where are you on your implementation plans? Do you think corrective action is complete? What's left to be done, et cetera. So we can't just respond that we're going to do something and then that's the end of it. It just doesn't work that way, unfortunately. All right, uh, this that reiterates a little bit just the volume. So annual single audits is performed by the state auditor's office every year. And the focus is compliance with uniform guidance, so federal regulation. And when we provide populations to them, it's really limited to federal awards. 
audits by state agencies that they're very frequent and some of them are onerous and a lot of them are, are federal pastors so what they're doing really is kind of a sub recipient monitoring function but they go very in depth sometimes and then audits by federal agencies that's less frequent i think because their portfolio of awards is just huge so <clears throat> Maybe TAMU or HSC or T's just doesn't show up on the radar as frequently as maybe with a state agency. But some of those, say with the NSF Office of Inspector General, um, those audits are very cumbersome. And then private sponsors, we get a few audits by private sponsors, but not a lot. So what do auditors typically look for? Well, in that preliminary phase I mentioned, they're really looking at internal controls. And the good thing about this area with Texas A&M is that it's a, we are a mature organization and there are you know, system level policies, uh, member level rules and SAPs and you know, SRS desk manuals we have most of that stuff pretty tied down. So uh, we might accidentally give them something that the wrong thing, then we don't realize what exactly they're trying to request. And But we usually will correct that through discussion. And uh, we usually end up pretty good on the written policies and procedures. As well, transactions properly documented. I mean, I think we do a pretty good job of that, especially now with uh, procurement cards going through concur that's helped a lot i mean so we don't have a ton of uh, findings in that area either allowability sometimes that's uh, kind of open for interpretation so we do get into discussions about that topic sometimes um, of course compliance with uniform guidance and sponsor terms and conditions that can be related to special kinds of um, expenditures like participant costs or travel. And then allocability, we do get into discussions about this sometimes if and these usually aren't very large expenditures, but maybe you're using a copier and it services, you know, four different awards, what's the methodology for allocating the cost? So we do get into the com those conversations sometimes. And then they usually look at personnel. <clears throat> um, key personnel should be actively engaged. Uh, a lot of us know the rules about when disengagement happens or the PI transfers to a new, another institution and you need to replace the PI, all that communication with the sponsor has to happen. So they sometimes look at those things. And then they often ask for effort certifications. So we work with uh, Tamra group on that. And then cost sharing matching, if there is an element to the award related to cost share, they, they're usually interested in that. And then cost transfers, they can easily see that in the transaction files that we send, send them because there's a credit. And sometimes it's just correcting an object code or, but it might be from one award to another award or, coming onto the award from a non-sponsored account. There's just a lot of different scenarios and the auditors are generally interested in that. Uh, I wrote, this is related to cost transfer justification form. So what the auditors don't like to see is just some generic description. They wanna see a little bit more details in these things. So this is an example that's generic and I have on the next slide an example that's a little bit more detailed. So let's go one, two, three question. I'll, I'll switch slides. So why was the expense originally charged to the account from which it's now being transferred? The generic response is, you know, essentially it was a mistake. Animal care services were charged to this project, but shouldn't have been. This transfer corrects that mistake. That is entirely true but a little bit more detail could be added to it. For instance, this response. 
animal care services for Dr. Russell were charged project XYZ in October. However, Dr. Russell works on project X, Y, and Z, and the charges benefited that project exclusively. So a lot more detail, it's very clear why the transfer needs to take place. And then back to the generic one. Question two is why should this charge be transferred to the proposed receiving account? So essentially what I was saying is this is making, this is correcting the error. That's generic. But if we said Dr. Russell contributed contributes effort to the receiving account and the services exclusively benefited, benefited of that project, that's a little bit better description. <clears throat> and then question three is related to transfers over 90 days. <clears throat> um, the generic response might be how we just realized the mistake and we're, we're hoping that it doesn't happen again where number three could explain maybe something that's gonna happen in the future that would better detect these kinds of things. So reconciliation process found the um, error and they're gonna increase the frequency of the reconciliations to detect these transfers timely. Now I just wanted to go through a few of the common audit types and just tell you what the findings were recently, or maybe just like common findings in some cases. So as I mentioned earlier, FY21 was um, one of the years when the state auditor's office did detail testing for the single audit. And, you know, they did a lot of testing, a lot of work, and it took months. And I was pretty pleased that they only had these two findings. One of them is related to equipment. So property records, um, uniform guidance lays out some elements that are required. And in a few cases, those elements were missing or maybe a location description was incorrect because the equipment had been moved and then no update had been um, recorded in the system. So I guess takeaways are, uh, whenever you're going through your annual inventory cycle, if there's a location that's incorrect, make sure it gets updated with Todd Gregory's group. Also, if there are missing tags, if there are missing serial numbers, um, make sure you communicate with Todd's group to get those things corrected. And then some subrecipient monitoring. This one was really an SRS related thing. Uh, they tested 30 sub awards. And we have a requirement in our procedures to perform a risk assessment prior to um, awarding a subaward. So one of them couldn't be located. We couldn't determine whether it just wasn't done or, or wasn't saved in, on the network properly or in Maestro. And then the other issue was that, again, Uniform Guidance has this laundry list of elements that has to be communicated to the subawardee. And in two cases, the um, subaward agreement didn't have a couple of the elements, things like um, FANE number or just those kinds of things. <clears throat> Overall, I think these aren't all that earth shattering. So I wasn't upset with these two findings. Secret. Um, since they issue, we get so many reports related to CPRIT, these are just common ones, common findings. So they have requirements for many different types of reports and they all have to happen in a certain order. And as people that work on CPRIT awards, you know this, you know, one thing has to happen before another can be, uh, the first thing has to be approved in the system by CPRIT, the sponsor before we can move to the next step. So hiccups early on in the uh, quarterly process can create problems. Um, this, the next two, as SRS, we don't have much control over this, but when PIs are publishing results, they need to be acknowledging secret funding if that award and that science had contributed to the publication 
and that extends to um, presentations, posters, like, you know, anything that is, has to do with CEPR funding needs to have this acknowledgement. And then this is a fairly new one, but I think, but CEPR also wants to see in publications that the PI or the contributor uses the CEPR scholar in cancer research title. They just started writing that finding about a year ago. <clears throat> and what they do really is the auditors will, uh, each progress report, the PI has the opportunity to upload pr presentations or state the title. And the auditors actually go and look at, uh, look at the publications and, and determine if these things are present. And then um, they have another unusual requirement at CEPRIT is that when we bill for reimbursement, we have to do that on a check date basis, not a batch date basis. So they wanna know that a check has actually left the building or the ACH has actually been issued to the vendor. So that re it requires some manual intervention with our business objects reports and sometimes errors happen with, as in any manual process, errors can happen. Um, NSF, that it's huge federal agency, obviously millions and millions of dollars awarded. So they're active in um, their reviews. The Office of Inspector General at the NSF is responsible performing, for performing a lot of these re reviews and they report directly to Congress. So they don't report to NSF administration they have the ears of Congress and they take their job very seriously in my experience. <clears throat> so what they did recently is they had been working on these audits for several years and they decided they wanted to compile results in a kind of generic way and communicate those out to award recipients. So if you hadn't been audited for a while, you could get ahead of these things. And if you had been audited, um, you had an opportunity to provide, uh, contribute a promising practice, they called it, and we did that. <clears throat> so these common findings are related to 18 reports that they had issued since September 2018. Um, so these are the most common categories, unallowable expenses, inappropriately applied indirect costs, inadequately supported expenses, inappropriately allocated expenses and non-compliance with the our own institutional policies and procedures. Again, this is this does include an audit of TAMU, but it's uh, 17 other institutions as well. So let's drill down into that a little bit. So unallowable expenses, <clears throat> travel, very common. So um, if, if, uh, if you're not using economy class, if you're using business uh, or first, first class, you have to justify that. And sometimes the auditors just didn't find the justification in the documents. And then not using Fly America, non-US flag car carriers used, um, travel outside the period of performance, obviously a big no-no. And then using proper per diem rates is a common finding. <clears throat> Related to participant support costs, uh, it might be coding non participant expenses in this category using the wrong object code, in other words, or rebudgeting participant support costs without NSF approval. Salaries and wages. Um, it's a common area, uh, either effort not appropriately certified or the salaries charged to the award were inconsistent with the certified amounts. I don't think TAMU has a problem so much in this area, but other institutions may. So related to materials and supplies, mainly these were purchases outside of the period of performance, publication costs, um, similar to what CEPR does, they, they read the publications and look for certain elements. 
And we always should reference the federal award that contributed to science that resulted in that publication. And then consulting services, sometimes we may not go through the proper procurement channels to get a consulting services agreement in place. Okay, related to indirects. So, um, indirect cost rates applying the proposed rate rather than the rates in effect at the time of the award. So, within SRS and with the members, we did look at this a few years ago, and I think we got ahead of it before our NSF OIG um, audit because we didn't get a finding in this area. So it might have been in the past that you know it made sense to us to use the proposed rate because that's what the um, NSF approved. But the, the proper thing to do, and I think we researched a lot of different institutions to see how they were doing it. Uh, we switched to using the rates that are in effect at the time of the award. And then IDC applied to the incorrect base so charging idc on things like equipment um, building building improvements that should be capital rather than expense and then not segregating the initial twenty five thousand of sub award costs so we can't after twenty five thousand, we can't charge idc any longer and then charging idc and particip participant support costs i think for the most part especially the bottom two we do use um, support accounts and so forth that can have a different IDC rate to control those things. I think there was one uh, equipment component that we got into a little bit of a discussion with the NSF over this, but it was a glider that cruises around the, the ocean and measures temperature and salinity, et cetera, but it had hit a boat or something and just, um, uh, kind of damaged the antenna. So they had to replace the antenna, which was seven, $8,000. And we just expensed it because it just made the glider functional again and put it back in its original condition. Well, so we expensed it and we thought that was the right thing to do. Auditors argued that it should have been capitalized and no IDC would have been charged. So I think we disagreed with that finding. But anyway, these are the kinds of discussions you can get into. And if it comes to this, maybe contact FMO and try to, you know, work out what the best treatment for the for the cost should be. Okay, just in general, inadequately supported expenses. So it could be lack of approvals. Let's just go through them. So cost claimed on a draw. So if there's a draw that's uh, $55,000, we should be able to support all of that cost. And uh, in some cases, apparently some institutions had trouble with that or applying credits as a cost reduction in the um, cost claim. Internal service providers, we all know that these, um, these service providers have to have rate studies periodically to support the charges. They shouldn't be profit centers. Um, they're allowed to have reserves and so forth, but they shouldn't be true profit centers. So the NSF looks at, you know, the rate studies and did they come to the right conclusion, et cetera. And sometimes apparently that they decided that the conclusion wasn't right. And then travel, you know, when PIs travel to attend a conference in Europe, sometimes they'll tag on some extra time for personal travel. And sometimes those um, expenses can get commingled. Salary and wages, um, obviously, it mentions timesheets here. That's obviously related to hourly employees, but apparently the, the auditors always or don't always see the timesheets um, supporting the hourly charges. And then again, with the missing consultant agreements. <clears throat> so inappropriately allocated expenses, 
Um, this generally comes up when there are multiple awards being, you know, could be benefiting from an expense. So with travel, um, again, use an example, PI goes to Europe to present on a topic. It's got more than a, one award that is related to that topic. So maybe you should decide how to allocate and not charge all the expenses to one project. And then the auditors, again, looking in annual reports, sometimes they find that the travel isn't mentioned. Materials and supplies and equipment, uh, purchases near the grant expiration, that always um, makes them question you know, how useful that equipment could have been to the results of the science if you only had it for the last two months of the award. Sometimes there's a good explanation. Other times, you know, they just disagree that it, it should have been charged to the, to the award. Publications, again, they're going through these. They're looking for references to the funding sources, and sometimes they find inconsistencies. So, again, this is kind of out of our hands, but PI should be aware that they, they need to make their, the funding sources referenced correctly. And then student type stipends and tuition remission. Maybe we're charging all of the tuition costs to one award, but the effort certification says that that grad student worked on two different awards. So they might at 50-50 rate. So they might question, well, shouldn't the cost be allocated the same way? And then general non-compliance. So they will get copies of our own policies and procedures and then compare what actually happened with these transactions to the way they think it should have happened based on our policies and procedures. So they had found, you know, written findings in the areas of, for instance, effort certification, procurement, processing sub invoices, travel. It's not necessarily TAMU related. I'm talking about this is just um, a compilation of 18 different audits that the NSF has done. And then not only our own policies and procedures, but NSF program specific policies, such as with i awards and IPAs. Um, in that same compilation report, NSF published these few things that awardees can do to try to prevent findings in the future. So continually monitor and verify the allowability of high risk expenses. I think we do a pretty good job of that because I like that they even use high risk in the description here because as you know, Aggiebuy has programmed in it that high risk expense codes are routed through SRS for a second set of eyes. Um, and that's that's a great control. Um, strengthen controls over applying IDC cost rates or indirect cost rates. Ensure award recipients create and maintain sufficient appropriate documentation. That's a no brainer. I think we do a pretty good job of that. Document and justify allocation methodologies. <clears throat> um, we did have a finding comes to mind where a Scantron was used to evaluate uh, survey results and that Scantron machine is fairly expensive and it was used on multiple awards and they had done a good allocation methodology. They documented it, but it, the, that study had been done like two years prior to the expense that ended up in the audit. And they still wrote us up because they said that it needs to be more current. Um, so in other words, do a rate study every six months or every time you have to pay a bill, which is, seems a little overkill, but they wrote us up anyway. Uh, regularly review and update grant management policies and procedures. Um, you know, that responsibility is very widely distributed. It's, you know, SRS, FMO system, 
uh, member. So I, I do think we do a pretty good job of that. Some things to look out for in your own world, you know, excessive cost transfers, generic justifications, mostly for cost transfers, costs incurred near the end of the project, especially for equipment, insufficient documentation or approvals, unreasonable or undocumented allocation methodologies, and effort that's either uncertified or some other non-compliant issue. So just thinking of ahead a little bit, this is the last couple slides. <clears throat> if you do receive an audit announcement, please notify your um, supervisor and forward it to myself. Uh, my contact information is on the next slide. I can help a lot. So you don't have to be in all the details. Generally, I might need your help. But Kathy and I were, you know, experienced at managing these things. And we can usually be pretty self-sufficient. And then mainly for people that are reviewing um, agreements, negotiators perhaps, Sometimes sponsors will have language in those awards that require an audit, like require us to go hire an auditor. If you see that, bring it to our attention. Um, it's best that we can negotiate those things out. It's costly. The auditor, the um, sponsor might agree to pay for it, but it's costly to us in terms of time. Mm -hmm. And maybe there are other ways that we can provide assurance to the sponsor outside of having an audit. Um, here's my contact information and Kathy Reek, uh, Senior Data Analyst at SRS. She helps with a lot of these audits. She's invaluable. She's very good at famous concur, uh, canopy, uh, business objects, all those things that we need to work with to accomplish these audits. So don't hesitate to contact us if you if you have a need or a question. And I thank you for your time. I hope you learned something. Well, thank you, Evan. I appreciate it. You gave us a lot of good information there. Uh, we have time for questions now. So uh, if somebody wants to uh, ask a question through the chat or you can unmute uh, and be glad to take your questions. I've got one here. Um, you know, we all seem to, to dread audits. Can an audit be a good thing? Can an audit actually help the institution? Well, um, David, in my experience, it's usually a painful process, but it can have its benefits, especially in my mind, if it's the internal audit department at your institution performing the audit because really in that case, you're getting ahead of some issue that might be identified by, by a sponsor, which would be worse, right? So they might have suggestions related to policies and procedures or even efficiencies, uh, which are valuable. Very good, Evan. Uh, you, you kind of touched on this in a slide, just the uh, uh, last slide or so. But uh, the question is, do we need to review and be aware of audit requirements and awards? Uh, do we sometimes find language that requires the awardee to pay for the audit? And if so, why would that be important? Um, we do. As, as, as I mentioned, those audits, even if the sponsor is going to pay for it, it's very time consuming for us to go out and identify a CPA firm to perform the audit and then, you know, jump through all the hoops of getting to a report. And so it, it is best if we can negotiate those terms out. And sometimes the terms are, are fine. It will just say, you will comply with uniform guidance audit requirements. That's fine. Um, we do that anyway. We don't have a choice. State Auditor's Office. Um, <clears throat> so 
state auditor's office requires us to be included in that. So those terms are fine. Good. Uh, here's a related question that came in. Other than a required uh, audit in the agreement language, is there any other language that might come back to haunt us uh, when an audit is done? Yeah, if there are specific travel restrictions or you have to notify or get approval from the sponsor for this, that, and other, those things can come back to bite you. So I know our negotiators do their best to, to stick to sort of pre-approved kind of language templates and, and try not to get anything too crazy. Another thing, it might be a, a reporting requirement that causes accounts receivable to go outside of their normal process. Uh, for instance, is uh, that using check date versus batch date to decide which um, expenses are eligible for reimbursement. There are, CEPR is not the only one, there's at least one other state agency, I forget who it is, but you know, that just causes extra work. Right, thank you. Uh, in your opinion, when should an organization prepare for an audit? Oh, that's ongoing, right? As transactions actually occur, make sure the documentation is in place, it's allowable, you have invoices to support it, requisitions if required. Um, if it's of a certain dollar amount, it has to go through procurement, so make sure those things happen. Um, so it's just all the time. Yeah. You may have touched on this, but what should departments do to help ensure there, there are less audit findings? Oh, it's the, that's the related to the question, the, the previous question. It's really just make sure that allowability um, of the expenses um, that is within a period of performance, proper approvals are there, um, supporting documentation, especially for procurement cards, uploading those in, um, receipts into Concur, in other words, and just, just all those things. Thanks very much, and we appreciate everybody for joining us today.